uh, <coughs> my dear friends, I uh, should be, I am not addressing you as ladies and gentlemen because uh, I know many of you and I thought I didn't want to be very formal by calling you ladies and gentlemen. In fact, I was present in when one minister uh, read out a speech uh, prepared by his secretary and uh, the, he read it very interestingly. He said, uh, uh, gentlemen, I know you so well to call you gentlemen. <laughs> and um, in fact, he, there is again another thing. Uh, his secretary has written, ladies, if any, and gentlemen. He said, uh, don't say ladies if there are no ladies. Those days, of course, ladies never used to come uh, very much. I'm talking about 30, 40 years back. So he read out literally, ladies, if any, and gentlemen. <laughs> and anyway, it um, uh, doesn't matter. Though. Why can't we see some lights there? And I can't see the face of the people. Uh, you know, the problem with me is if I can't see uh, the eye of a person, it's very difficult for me to speak. Can you believe it? I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, become a habit with me and uh, it's very difficult for me to get away from it. <clears throat> Let me, first of all, uh, thank all of you for uh, coming and uh, participating in this uh, annual uh, celebrations. Uh, what uh, our uh, host today said, uh, had three amendments. Uh, uh, one is that uh, she said that it looks like uh, we are entering the teens, 13. Sometimes either it could be interpreted, are we entering the, uh, when we enter the 13, we are entering 13 years or we are entering 13 months. Uh, it looks to me that given the size of our country and given the size of our problems, uh, what we are talking in terms of over 185 crores, it looks to me like that we have just started taking our baby steps. Uh, it is just like... Uh, 13-month-old child uh, taking its first step forward and the parents feeling so delighted about it. And uh, in fact, I, every one of you would remember as a parent that your child taking the first step, the mother would feel that she has achieved something great, that the child has started walking. For many of us uh, uh, belong to the generation, it seems to me that uh, we are taking only the baby step forward. and. Uh, we are still a long, long way to go uh, before we can really think in terms of saying that uh, we are doing anything worthwhile. But that baby step is also important, important for the parents and important for the child. And uh, in a way that when uh, Daval suggested that this should be celebrated, we all said that uh, yes, this should be celebrated because this is a very good baby step. More importantly, I think uh, on this uh, Important occasion, this is the first year, I believe, since the inception um, of uh, the organization. And the person who created the organization is sitting here quietly, is uh, Venkat. He is the one who, whose brainchild this organization was. And um, he had his dreams. And um, every year we used to sit and plan. And we used to plan modestly, but uh, within our uh, vision, ambitiously. But we never were able to achieve uh, what we sought out to plan. And this is perhaps, I'm told, the first year in which we achieved 100% of what we had uh, planned. In fact, uh, the board uh, was delighted at it. I mean, in a sense, in one sense, there was a pride in achievement. In another sense, there is also the humility that goes with that achievement. Because we knew that we achieved so little in a country of this uh, size and so proportions and this potential and what is it that we have achieved. That feeling also is there but at the same time I think uh, it would be my duty to not only thank uh, Naval and uh, his team for the excellent work that uh, had been done during the year in meeting the achievement. It gives a satisfaction that you set about to achieve a goal and that goal is uh, achieved. And that when achievement of the goal gives a moment of pride and pleasure and satisfaction. And I can, uh, we want to share that uh, pride and satisfaction with not only amongst ourselves, 
but uh, also with all those people who are responsible for contributing to this. The people, donors, the people, the payroll companies, the people who really were part of us uh, right through. So, so it is not 13 years, it is 13 months that uh, really uh, seem to be the defining point. The second point that, uh, as she mentioned it, I am being very frank, and as my friends know, that I don't prepare what I will say. Sometimes I may say something inappropriate, excuse me for that. When she said that uh, we want to express our gratitude, I started wondering who should express gratitude to whom? After all, we are all in it together. It is not that, uh, I mean, uh, see, um, I, I sometimes, uh, I used to be very surprised when traveling abroad about 20, 25 years back, when I first started traveling 40 years back, um, the, the, I used to hear, uh, I mean, travel with uh, raising money, there's quite a lot, quite a lot of the investment bankers, foreign investment bankers will come with me. There will be young boys who will be coming with me. And uh, they just can't wait. They will uh, take a phone and call their wives and uh, want to talk to the wives. And every conversation would end by saying, I love you. <coughs> uh, it seems it was quite strange to me. Why should I say, I love you? Is it not obvious that you love? Why should you keep on repeating? Because in our culture, we don't say that. Have you ever say, uh, heard people say that... Uh, conversation to the uh, wives that I love you, I love you, I love you. That form of reaffirmation and reiteration is uncalled for in our society. In the same way I feel that this uh, extension of gratitude is uh, totally uncalled for because you and I are in it of the same purpose. I mean after all there is something which binds all of us together apart from a very uh, spiritual way of looking at it that all of us are related in some form or other. This is a theory which uh, I have started believing in recent times uh, very firmly. Namely that there is uh, no difference between uh, you and me. Uh, in fact, we are all related. In fact, uh, there, is, there, is a, there was a very interesting uh, saint who lived in the uh, 19th century by name Swami Ramtirtha. Uh, who was a contemporary of Swami Vivekananda. His books, uh, uh, six volumes book, uh, The Woods of God Realization, I used to read those about 20, 25 years back. Uh, he would begin all his, it was a compilation of all his speeches. He would begin all his speeches by saying that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my, no, myself in the form of ladies and gentlemen. He saw a reflection of himself in uh, others. In the same way, I think, uh, in a spiritual sense, I believe that we are all, uh, uh, in a way, part of the whole. The whole is something which we are not able to comprehend. Nowadays it is becoming, science is becoming so advanced. More and more books which I read now reiterate that point. The cosmic consciousness is a single consciousness. I could never understand Adi Shankara's Advaita philosophy. Namely that there is no non-duality. Is something is very difficult to comprehend because we see multiplicity all around. How can there be non-duality? How everything can be one? Now I am becoming fully convinced and I am able to experience that we are all one. We are all one part of the whole. And uh, we are just a fragment of the whole. And the whole does not diminish with our going out. The whole does not increase with our coming in. So we are all in it together. We are all part of the whole. And we share the same level of passion. We share the same level of uh, aspiration. What is our passion and aspiration? I think every one of you is uh, assembled here. Whether he is a member, or he or she is a member of the Give India team, or whether they are associated with Give India in some form or other. We are passionate about something that we are passionate about our country. We are passionate about the suffering of the people. We are passionate about the need for the amelioration of the living conditions of our countrymen. We believe that something good will have to happen during our, uh, our time. In a sense that before we depart from this universe, we must see some change in the living conditions. We have a sense of delight. We have a sense of pride. I mean, when I see, when I, the uh, driver who drives me, when I come here in ICICI Bank, 
um, I encourage his son to join the engineering college. When he comes and says that my son has now become the chief engineer in the some uh, ship, uh, marine engineering, it fills you with a sense of joy that you are able to contribute something to this. Uh, this happened. He came to me with his when his daughter finished his twelfth standard and said, "Sir, what do you think we should uh, do?" I told her, "Put her in college." I said, but I don't know whether uh, I should, I could afford it and whether it's the right thing for to. I said, go ahead and do it. She is now working in London uh, with her husband in a software company. I mean, you feel so delighted and you and I share that passion, share that uh, commitment that we are here for this purpose. We see uh, that uh, in, the, we live in a country where there is uh, so much insensitivity. I mean, yeah, insensitivity in a sense, people, sometimes people get knocked down in the car, road, people don't care, they walk. I think there, somebody showed a picture that day, TV, in the t YouTube it came, that how a person lies knocked down and how many people did not even bother to look up, that person is uh, alive or dead, whether he should be taken. Insensitivity is something which is uh, so <coughs> much part of our society. In fact, uh, I remember reading a Chinese story and the Chinese story is that the, 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 there was a king and the king uh, uh, wanted his son to be trained. So he wanted, uh, he took the son to the most uh, intelligent per say, person who was a Buddhist monk who was well known for his uh, uh, wisdom and he said, I want you to train my son to be the king. The Buddhist monk looked at him, are you sure that you have come to the right place? Said, yes, I want you to train him. He said, in that case, you better leave him here. I will uh, look after him. So he told uh, this uh, young prince, saying that you go to the forest, which is nearby, and spend one year in the forest. And then, uh, uh, Guruji, what should I do in the forest? You come back and report to me, what did you hear in the forest? He came back after a year, he said, what did you hear? I heard uh, the noise of the thunder, I heard the noise of the uh, river flowing, I heard the lion's roar, I heard the elephant's bleat. The master looked at him, yes, you did a good job, but I think you need to spend one more year. So he goes for one more year. So after that he says, what did you hear? Oh, I heard this time birds chirping and I heard uh, this uh, noise of uh, 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 gentle wind blowing and the rustling of the grass. I, ah, I see some improvement. But still you are not heard enough. I think you must go for a third year and spend some more time. At the end of the third year, when he came, then the, he said, what did you hear? I heard the sound of the flowers blossoming. Yes. I heard the rainbow forming on the sky. The sound of the rainbow forming in the sky. And uh, the master said, now you have learned. Now I think you are fit to be the king. So the prince goes to the king and the king asks him, what happened? What did you learn? He said, this is what my master taught me. He comes back to the master and says, uh, what did you teach him? I mean, what is it all about uh, hearing sounds? He said, in the first year, he heard the gross sounds. The second year, he was able to hear the subtle sounds. The third year, he was became so sensitive that he, he could hear, he could be sensitive to even unexpressed grievances. As a, as a prince, what I want him is, a king should be sensitive not only to the grievances of his subjects which are expressed, but the grievances, he should be in a position to anticipate the grievances. He should be in a position to become, be sensitive to the grievances of the people. And that sensitivity he was able to achieve in the year, third year. I think this story made an remarkable impression on me. Now, why is it that as a nation, we are not sensitive to the fact that there is so much of poverty in the country. And this is worrying me. And today, when we are all assembled here today, I found 
that what binds you and me together, what binds all of us together, is the fact that uh, we share the same passion, we share the same sensitivity. Because you and I are not the ones who will just pass by when somebody is suffering. I, we would stop and take a look at it. Can I do something to relieve the suffering of this uh, person? We are also share the passion, we share the conviction that 60 years after we became independent, since I was a young 11 year old kid, uh, when we became independent, I, I remember the scene. I did not know what independence meant. And uh, I said that something great event has taken place. I was living in Chennai at that time. And uh, at the midnight, everybody poured out into the streets. And uh, we didn't have a television, we did not have a radio. We were young uh, people and we were just uh, walking. And where were we walking? But uh, what is our destination? We did not know anything about it. We just became a part of a huge crowd that thronged the city. And we are walking, we are walking and celebrating, saying that we achieved independence. Gradually it dawned on us that the independence meant that there is going to be freedom, we think the poverty which we saw would disappear and there would be improvement in the living conditions of the people. But 60 years have gone, 65 years have gone, we don't see that visible improvement in the living conditions of the people. I think it looks to me that having lived a fairly long life, I am getting close to 77 and uh, many of the years when I lived, I don't think that there is a visible change that has been brought about. People can challenge me on that. There has been improvement. But you look at that improvement uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, what you see. I mean, in one uh, conference which I had to address, when somebody claimed that uh, uh, poverty uh, 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 proportion has come down from 30% to 22%, I think, sir, have you looked at the numbers? 30% of 300 million, 400 billion is very different from 22% or 1.3 billion. So the number of poor people has increased. Uh, how many times have we been able to see? Yes, that's I think that we missed this whole uh, process. We believe that we have not been able to make an impact on it. And that's the reason. After all, one way of looking at Give India's mission is very simple. Give India really wants uh, it's a very focused point. Namely that we want to use our energy in promoting the culture of uh, philanthropy in the uh, country. I mean, it is not as though that philanthropy was not there. Philanthropy was there. But philanthropy was, was a very different purpose. Philanthropy was uh, always associated with a religious sense, uh, giving a religious uh, charity or anything like that. I don't know whether uh, you uh, know of one president. You, many of you are young and some of you, of course, uh, very may remember. There used to be a president by name Vivi Giri. Have you heard of him? His wife Saraswati Giri, I remember very well, because uh, that is uh, the Commissioner of Police in Hyderabad gave me the story, whether you believe the story or not, it is true. And uh, she uh, used to travel by train from Delhi to Hyderabad. And uh, Hyderabad used to be a sort of a second capital. There was a time uh, a proposal to make Hyderabad a, a, what you call uh, the summer capital of uh, uh, India. Uh, because there's be one in the south and one in the north. Uh, she used to come from Delhi uh, and uh, she wanted to go to Badrachalam, that uh, the temple. So, as usual, the security was all cleaned up and uh, what do you do when you're in the Badrachalam? The first thing you do is to clear the place and make it clear and there should be no intruders. And Badrachalam, have you ever been? I don't know. There used to be lots of beggars there in uh, Badrachalam. They would be lining up on either side of the temple. The first thing the police did was to clear them up all and then send them far away. And then next day they would come back. But that day during the president's wife's visit, they should not be there. So this gentleman who told me the story of Saranian, who was the commissioner of police, he, he, the president's wife got down and she said, you know, I must uh, go to a bank. I said, uh, why, madam, why do No, no, we were, I must get some small change. You know, it has been my habit. In Badracharam, there would be a lot of beggars. And uh, it was my habit of uh, giving uh, small change to them. So, then he got a fright of his life because he did not know whether the beggars are there or not. 
and so he co contacted his uh, counterpart in the wireless and said, are you sure that the beggars are there? Sir, there are no beggars here, everybody has been sent away. So bring them back, bring them back. You know. No, but they have been sent away very far. I think we have to take a long time for, to bring them back. He said, no, but somehow or other we must, because the president's wife has just uh, wanted some small change. We have just got about 35 minutes, 40 minutes to reach that. I don't know what you will do, but you ensure that there are enough beggars there for, for her to receive the arms. And uh, she went and uh, Saranian was uh, all in uh, great anxiety. Fortunately, there were beggars on uh, either side lined up. The only difference was they were all pot-bellied beggars. The, the people were very fat and healthy and uh, uh, President's wife must have been very satisfied with the way in which they looked. What he did was, the local man, for want of doing anything, he asked, asked all the policemen, you strip. <laughs> you stand on either side of that. Well, that's the only way in which I can provide the beggars. And, and um, those days, we all gave uh, culture, uh, money, not so much for the purpose of uh, the, uh, uh, ameliorating the conditions of the poverty, but to take care of ourselves. Because culturally, religiously, we were told that there is a punya waiting for us when we do this culture. We had to accumulate up enough of punya in order to do that, and we gave the credit. I think that is no longer the governing condition. Today, the motivation for uh, giving is very different. The motivation for giving is uh, what are we going to do to uh, the society. In the social sector particularly, I, I am honest enough to make an assessment. I have come to the conclusion after uh, nearly four decades of working very near the government, government, I don't want to be harsh on the government. The government alone cannot resolve it. Three, three points which I'm, I'll let me make it. One is the government cannot resolve this problem of the social sector. Whether you are in the education, whether you are in the health, I look at the problem. 1.5, uh, uh, according to one survey which I read uh, recently, there are 1.5 million doctors that are required in this country to take care of the population of uh, 1.25 billion. If we apply the normal standards of uh, uh, ratio of uh, patients to the doctors, and we have only a fraction of that 1.5 million a year. And uh, how many uh, uh, people are graduating in this uh, doctors? Very few doctors are there. And schools we saw in the education, despite all that is being done, I mean, we conduct a survey, Pratham, as part of uh, this uh, uh, ESR survey, as we call it. And uh, our education level has not shown, despite the fact that Pratham has been doing glorious work. And uh, she mentioned in the introduction that has been, she read whatever has been given to her. And I can tell you the fact that Pratham, Pratham people believe that they have done a great job. But what is the impact on the ground? The impact on the ground is the quality of education has been coming down. The quality of health has been coming down. And international surveys, like, uh, they show that India is in the bottom of that data. But what is most astonishing is that recently I saw a presentation by Sony to its uh, chief ex senior executives. It says, India has 25 million kids who can be called high IQ kids, which is equal to the total number of kids in the United States. Also. That's the position. That is the potential which we have, but we are not able to expo exploit it and we are not able to do that because of the government is not in a position to come to the, and they will never set up that primary health clinic. The second important point is there are NGOs in large numbers and some of the NGOs have fire in their belly. They are, I mean, charged with it, uh, passion which is, before their passion, your passion and my passion is nothing. And you and I perhaps are intellectually passionate. Intellectually we believe that we must do something. These are the people who walk in the field and they are the people who are feeling the uh, uh, actual impact of the poverty on this. They are of a very different lot. And when I go and meet them, I get a fresh uh, burst of energy. My God, I can't just rest. When these people are working like that. They are the people who go there and who live in slums. They are the people who go 
and you know there is a hospital maternity hospital in uh, uh, Yagmore which is 150 years old in that maternity hospital for a woman to deliver a child the nurses have the brazenness to say that you bring your own water because we don't have water to wash your child and you have to bring your own bucket of water in order to wash the child and uh, there are there is one NGO which is working there, I think Bhagat is aware, I think it's, uh, uh, the Deepa has been mentioning that to me, and uh, Ekam, and look, you must meet that uh, Sai, Dr. Sai, and uh, she is willing to move around, despite the fact that she is also of ill health, she wants to do that. I think that's a passion that, uh, that's a second important factor that we must have, that people have that passion, that we must do something in respect of that uh, social sector. The third factor also which I must mention, and that's a very important factor, that all of us are acting in isolation. And because all of us are acting in isolation, somehow or other we are not able to make a collective impact on the society. I, this thought I had articulated in a few forums, I have not been able to develop it. Is it because of the fact that if you go and talk to any of these people, either Sai or Madhav Chavan or Pratham or anybody else uh, who have been doing a fabulous job, they are doing something great and they have their own evaluation mechanism and the evaluation mechanism shows that they have done a great job. But why is it that we have not been able to make a visible impact on the society? Because for some reason we are not able to come together collectively to make an impact. I think if you want to make a collective impact, it has to be either an Anna Hazare or Arvind Kejriwal, a sort of a political uh, type of uh, uh, coming together. Uh, a political, non-political type of coming together for solely with, not with a view to capture uh, power, not with a view to uh, teach the government a lesson, or not to tell the government what they have failed and where they have failed and what they should do but more constructive in nature of trying to do something to improve the lots of the people in the society. I think coming together can also achieve a constructive and other purpose. You know, they always used to say that you can mobilize people um, very much around uh, hatred. You can uh, mobilize people. Hitler was able to mobilize the nation against uh, what you call the Jews and said that uh, this is a common enemy. And against a common enemy, we all come together and say, okay, we all are in it together and we'll fight it. But when something more constructive is put forward, I think let the common enemy be seen as poverty. Let the common enemy be seen as a suffering. And let us come together for fighting it. Somehow or other, that ability to mobilize and ability to come, the type of leadership which is displayed during other times is not taking place there. That, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is what uh, I come more and more to realize, that given the vision of a philanthropy is only a subset of a much larger vision that we need to uh, entertain for the country. That larger mission that we have is the amelioration of suffering. Buddha started 2,500 years back. He identified suffering as something which is uh, a bane of the society. And all his uh, work, uh, even though he did uh, go on in salvation of the individual, he arrived at a truth in a very different sense. But the starting point of his uh, uh, work was uh, suffering of the people. He saw suffering. He saw suffering of the old people. He saw suffering of the sick people. He saw suffering of the people dying in the dying family. All these things uh, triggered something in him. And he said, I must serve the society. And that's how I think uh, Buddha's own uh, uh, search for salvation began and culminated in something which is remarkable. It survived even up to 2,500 years today. And the root cause of the suffering is that greed and the root cause of the suffering is that which we have to get away. I think it's time for us now to reflect. It's time for us to think and give India also should reflect. Think. We are now started taking our baby step. That's the reason why I said it's a 13 months is the first step that we are taking. But once we start taking that step, and we should become a teenager very fast. And we should become a teenager fast. And as a teenager, we can make a difference to the society. And I think if all of us, we can spread that message. And there is some leadership that emerges in the society. An apolitical, non-political leadership, which can galvanize this nation. Because there is enough potential in the country. Vivekananda, 150 years back, said, give me 1,000 people. We can transform the society. 
And we have tens of thousands of young men and women. And I see them every day. I see them in my every walk of life. And I am fascinated by what I see. I am fascinated by the passion which they display. If some way in which we can really bring them together, I think this society will be very different. Today when we assemble uh, to celebrate uh, the Give India and uh, to, for whatever it is worth, to express our sense of gratitude to all of you uh, to have joined in this uh, Again, I will repeat the collective mission of uh, relieving the suffering. This thought, I want to place it before you, and I want you to reflect on it. Thank you very much.